Written several books on Irish history, um, Ireland since the rising, and best-selling biographies uh, of Michael Collins and Eamon de Valera, and of course also wherever the uh, green is worn, which was really about us, the immigrants. Um, and tonight, um, Tim Pat Coogan and Mr. Coogan is going to uh, analyse. Sound, I mean, uh, <laughs> and, you know, something has happened. They, uh, he's going to uh, discuss with you the, his book, which was published in 2012, The Famine. No less. Uh, uh, many of you will have, uh, will obviously have read about the Great Famine and uh, the terrible things that happened. And of course, it raises so many questions about how did it happen, why did it happen, why were the Irish people so dependent on on predators and why was it allowed to happen and of course as we watch our TVs today yeah. uh, we can see some terrible things happening and we think why can't somebody do something about that. I am very hopeful and I'm very confident about the time the night is out you will have a much better understanding on of, uh, but before I do I do that before we get on obviously we are discussing some sad things but uh, uh, Tim Pat, being the, the professional that he is, has arrived here tonight okay. following the death of his of his brother, um, and uh, it's also uh, one of our great benefactors. As you know, this room and this house is called the the uh, Kathleen Connolly uh, House, um, and it's a year now since Michael Con Connolly, our benefactor. Uh, passed away. So what I would ask you to do in true Irish fashion, have a minute's silence for both Tim's uh, past brother and the late Michael Connolly. Thank you. We have a minute's silence, please. Thank you very much. And without further ado, I'm going to hand you over to Tim Pat, and then as normal we'll have a, have a session, then we'll have a comfort break, and uh, perhaps a glass of wine and a cup of coffee or tea, and then we'll have some questions after that. So, uh, Tim, thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you for that very dignified and moving tribute. Uh, my family would appreciate that very much. Thank you. I don't know about the technology. Can you all hear me now? Yes. Good, good. Well, as you know, the famine is one of the defining episodes in Irish history. I wouldn't be surprised if some of your ancestors are the reason for you being here, but certainly a lot of the people in the Irish diaspora joined it and made the impact they did on the world. It was a, an epoch-making event, it affected world history, uh, just to give you one example, where it had a benign effect, was we have a peace process in Ireland at the moment, which you wouldn't have were it not for the Irish in America. It was the political weight which the Irish brought to bear on the White House which made it possible. And with all the fine talk, without that there wouldn't have been a peace process. That's just one of many uh, examples. It was a horrible event, uh, which 
in, in a land of plenty shouldn't have happened. It happened at the height of uh, British imperial power, a uh, crescendo nearly of the uh, Victorian era. And that was one of the problems. Um, the impact of very powerful people at the cabinet sitting around the table deciding how Ireland should be governed, or how they should meet the challenge of the famine, also had a direct interest in having the famine do its worst, clear the people off the land. Some of the biggest landowners in Ireland at the time, which even Europe, were sitting at that cabinet table. Lord Palmerston, for example, Lord Clan Clanricard, Lord Fitzwilliam, uh, uh, Lord Lansdowne, I meant, sorry, uh, Lord Monteagle, men with varying degrees of uh, goodwill and so forth, but primarily they were imperialists. Uh, this was also the time of Hong Kong, you've seen in the news recently, looking for democracy. Well, the reason Hong Kong was in the news is because of the adjustment, the Chinese taking it over. In fact, the Chinese were taking it back. During the period I'm talking about now, these people at that table, Lord Palmerston in particular, founder as it were of gunboat diplomacy, they were taking over colonies, new colonies of Arabian knots at the time. He uh, decided that the opium trade should be enforced on the Chinese because British merchants were losing trade over it. They were complaining that they weren't <laughs> that profits had gone, they couldn't sell opium. And you can imagine the uproar if today, say, the Americans decided to enforce uh, cocaine sales on a country, what would have happened? But they were just able to take it over. They were so powerful. They invented new technology, new boats, mm -hmm. which could both sail and use engines, go up the great rivers, wiped out the uh, Chinese junks. And that's how they got Hong Kong. So that was the problem uh, in a human way, if you like. Then ideologically speaking, if imperialism wasn't enough, the uh, government of Peel, the conservative government, had fallen, and he'd actually fallen trying to help Ireland. He was introducing the Corn Laws, which was going to stop the tariffs preventing the sale of cheap international corn coming on the market and making bread cheap. He was only doing it for Irish interests or altruistic interests, but the people were flooding into the new cities that Victorian advancement was creating and they wanted bread. And of course with the squirearchy selling a deer, the wheat, the flower of deer behind tariff walls, that was impeding a requirement of the development of English society. And he um, had been an ex uh, chief secretary of Ireland. He was a convinced orange man, in fact, um, Daniel O'Connell referred to him as Orange Peel. Uh, but he also understood the country, and he knew that uh, this was necessary. They were going to, as he said, it's impossible to bring in the necessary uh, food, corn, to one part of the uh, United Kingdom and let the tariff wall stand in another. So that's how it was Ireland, as in so many cases, the experiment in Ireland worked over here. Uh, it was tried in Ireland first, be it the police service or whatever. They tried out these experiments in Ireland. And it, he was quite humane and deserves to be remembered as such. He brought in Sub Rosa without the cabinet being aware of it or the public being aware of it. He brought in shiploads of grain, even though the uh, corn laws were still in progress, still in operation. They didn't really affect the course of the famine because they, did, they were brought in by stages. And he brought this corn in and surreptitiously had it landed and distributed around uh, food depots. And then when the prices start to re go up as the uh, bright, uh, effect of the potato blight took hold, he'd release it on the market and so down it would go. As one well, of the terrible ironies of history, that just as um, the division bells were ringing in one part of the forest, the House of Lords, that the Corn Laws were going through, in another part, the Lower House, the House of Commons, 
you know, it was a kind of parliamentary ambush, and a lot of the people who were gunning for him, the squire archy, because he was taking away their, you know, captive market, they made common cause with the Liberals, and they overthrew him on a coercion bill for Ireland. So two Irish things affected him, and out he went, and the Liberals came in, and they had a totally different viewpoint. Uh, they were, apart from fair trade, free trade, and the Protestant virtues of hard work, and, and so forth, and the market forces, they were influenced by these famous economists like Malthus, and by the effects of the uh, London Club, which taught that uh, the, the market should control everything. Man had no right to sustenance, or if he was impoverished, that was his problem, uh, unless his family helped him. It wasn't a job for the state. And here they were confronted against a background of ferocious anti-Catholicism and the residues of uh, the hatred stirred up in extreme Protestant circles by giving the grant of a new Catholic emancipation. That was only in 1829, we're now talking about the middle 20, middle 40s. So there wasn't much sympathy for Ireland to put in mind of going around. And there was a sharp change in policy. And one of the sharpest, worst effects of that was one man in particular, the Treasury Secretary or Under Secretary, Charles Trevelyan, became the czar of Irish relief. In effect, that's what happened. And Sir Charles Woods, the um, Wood, the uh, Chancellor of the Exchequer, was of similar mind. So, sympathy to the poor or the indigent was very, very lacking. Sympathy to the Irish didn't exist. Uh, one of the things that I did for the book was I've discovered a letter which, um, well, it's just two articles actually in the Morning Post, uh, the Morning Chronicle, which uh, Trevelyan had written. Much to the annoyance of Peel, Peel had not been talking to him for nearly three years uh, because of his attitude to Ireland. He'd been six weeks in Ireland, came back, briefed his minister, then went out and he wrote some very easily identifiable articles in the big paper at the time. <coughs> and Peel struck him off the list, didn't talk to him. And now this man, with the attitudes he had to the Irish, to the clerics, and so forth, to O'Connell and to appeal. He was now in a key position, very unsympathetic, and bolstered by a whole lot of uh, nonsense about Providence deciding these things, and it was Providence and the will of God that the people were going to die. That was their own fault. They had too many children, procreation, and so forth. And in one aspect of this, he was right, Catholic teaching on, on uh, birth control, when you look at the situation, because of the um, problems of the past and of invasion and taking over land, so many of the Catholics who were driven over from their good land into the inhospitable West, very beautiful but very difficult to raise a goat in the place, and uh, there they were on a line left of the Shannon, if you like, take it from Dingle Bay up to the Foyle, you get an idea places like Mayo in particular, and they were living on one crop mainly, and the subdivision of land, the thing was the shambles. Uh, the, the landlords uh, were largely because of the act of union, they got out of the country. It's, you know, sometimes said that the original Irish Parliament was Parliament of Protestants and planters, and completely out of sympathy with the people, which to a large extent they were. But any parliament has a potential for growth and development. And this one was just wiped out by the Act of Union. They came over here and everybody, the plumber, the poet, the politician, the publisher, silversmith, they followed the money, they followed the parliament, they came to London, they came to England. And just Ireland just kind of subsided on the one hand. No decision-taking apparatus of our own. And whatever about the potential of the parliament, it more and more power is now coming to devolve on the desk of one man in Whitehall, a civil servant, backed up by a sympathetic government and an anti-Catholic cabinet and establishment. And against that ghastly overcrowded landscape, 
in places like, if you know Mayo or Eris uh, or Connemara, one landlord, for example, Humanity Dick Martin, they called him. He was the man who founded the uh, Royal, Hospital, Royal Society of Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. He was also, uh, somewhat paradoxically, one of the great duelists of Europe. And uh, somebody asked him, you know, how could he reconcile the two? And he said, well, bullocks can't shoot. <laughs> and uh, he, I don't think, was, would ever put himself forward as uh, uh, the epitome of the ideal estate manager. But he owned virtually modern Connemara. He owned all from basically uh, the suburbs of present-day Galway, all from the sea, up roughly up to, to the mountains, and out to Killary Bay. It was one of the biggest estates in Europe, 200,000 acres. And to give you an example, an idea of the destruction of the famine, uh, with the overcrowding and people just taking a bit of land, maybe an acre, and then subdividing that, but you could still grow enough potatoes to feed people. Unfortunately, there were too many people being born. And one of the difficulties is that uh, the census for the figures at the time are not reliable. They tell you one thing, but if you think about the circumstances, there's no way that people would have pressed out in the bogs, in the fogs, to the cabins, and into the mud holes, and they lived in holes cut into bogs. Uh, not houses as we know them, or habitations as we know them. But his estate was 200,000 acres, and there was certainly at least one person, probably far more, of course, to each uh, acre. And uh, he had on that estate one workhouse, Clifton Workhouse. And his, he had to uh, take steps, long and rapid steps, to get out of the country because he was bankrupt. He died before the full effect of it came, but his daughter had to get out. And his son, or his granddaughter, had to get out. And his son actually contracted famine fever and died. And this shambolic estate was eventually sold long after the famine. And a note was put into the brochure by the auctioneers, which told the whole story and then said, prospective buyers are advised that the people named in the 1841 census as living on this estate now no longer live there. We're gone. 200,000 people in that area alone. So exactly how did it happen? Well, they changed the rules when the Liberals came in, and uh, Peel had been interfering with the markers, pushing the meal out from time to time, to keep down the flour to keep down the price, and they, they swept that away. No, nope. that'd have to be uh, people who didn't work wouldn't wouldn't eat, and with that attitude, stony attitude. Uh, the famine, the, the, the blight struck again that in 45, 46 Peel was there. It struck again in 47. And in that year, because the Quakers, who deserve great credit in Irish history, uh, they had started soup kitchens. They started, the government started them as well eventually under protest and groaning. And they fed as many as three million people daily with them. But at the end of the year, uh, as I said in my book, it, it was akin to Hitler at the end of the war, moving non-existent armies around maps. Uh, Trevally went on holidays that year, phenomenal worker, he worked all over Christmas, everything came over his desk. But he went off uh, saying that we're now um, transferring peacefully all the necessary apparatus uh, to the people themselves to look after themselves and work schemes and so on to take care. And they stopped the feeding. Now that was actually a genocidal act. It was, it was one of the worst years in history. Now when you think of bad weather, you do in modern terms, you think about umbrellas, wellies, raincoats, you have to cast your mind back, think of people coming out of cabins where smoke went through a hole in the wall, up in the ceiling, 
because of the various penal laws. <coughs> if you had windows, they were taxed, the door they were taxed, and you might have, God knows so many kids, <coughs> living there. And there was, of course, no rain gear, barefooted, probably half naked. And the phrase came to be used, natural causes. The resolution of the crisis had to be left to natural causes. But if you put a granny and her daughter and husband and seven or eight children out on an Irish hillside in the month of January, barefooted, with no roof over their head, natural causes will solve your problem pretty quickly. If you get to the second week, it's rather high foot. And the general figure which you're given of the deaths of the famine um, is completely unreliable. Uh, uh, a modern um, historian called Joel Mogler uh, reckons that the standard figure of a million dead and a million emigrating is absolutely wide of the mark. It should be at least two million dead and then you must figure out in or factor in uh, un uh, averted births, people who either died, weren't born or were born in other countries, and at least to be into emigration. And you have to remember that the Irish population coming up to 1841 was tending, at least officially, to the 9 million mark. And if you just think for a second of the famines that you would be aware of, like Darfur, uh, they lost nearly a quarter of a million in a famine. But there were some 21 million people in the, in the country, in the Sudan. Now, if you take the kind of figures I'm talking about out of a population of less than 9 million, you're really cutting a tree down near the roots. And that's what happened in Ireland. And it wasn't just, you've got to remember that it didn't just happen in Black 47, as they say, which was the year the Trevelyan Company cut out the soup kitchens. It went on, 48, 49, 50, 51. It was a horrendous lot on the then ruling class, who were, of course, as hostile to the ordinary peasants in England as they were to the best. These were imperialists, they were looking for a profit not philanthropy and not Christianity, though they use these catchphrases like providence, and this <coughs> divine will on Ireland for being so feckless, having too many children and so on. And one of the reasons that I say you can't trust the figures is that indeed they did have far too many children for that amount of land, for one acre of land and potatoes. I mean, the size of the families, mind-boggling. In my hotel where I'm staying tonight, I was talking to some of the staff, and one of them, who has been living here, as was her mother, and her mother and father, for a very long time. But it's in their family records, and they're very proud of it, that their, their, great, their grand's great-grandmother had 18 children. Can you imagine that? 18 children living in one of these cabins. So when disease, and of course, all the diseases that come from lack of nutrition, apart from the weather and so forth, are phenomenal. And they just scythe through the population. And the uh, outcry, such as there was, didn't have much effect. I mean, you think this couldn't happen, mm -hmm. but just how little effect did the outcry against George Bush and Tony Blair going into Iraq? In our time, with television, electronic wonders in the sky, you can't stop her for people. And some of the worst uh, enforced embarkments and shipments out of the country took place from these landowners. Palmerston, Clan Rickard, and indeed Lord Lansdowne. It's on record that there are people who arrived, a woman arrived naked off one of the ships in snow in Canada. Uh, the, New York papers are there to be looked at, and they talk about the tenants of the Lansdowne estate, which is still virtually intact, at least over here, Boworth, uh, 
it's still one of the, uh, Bosworth is still one of, oh Wood, sorry, still one of the great homes of England. Some of the great fortunes made in Ireland are still here, still fueling the aristocracy, and these were the people that slowed up the peace process and that allowed the unionist establishment to carry on for so long with uh, no democracy. If you're a Catholic, you didn't get a house, you didn't get a job, you got out. Because the old blood and old money, those are the people who were tied up in the House of Lords, and they have about as much interest now as these people would have had then. And they certainly wouldn't have any great more affection for the average five-eighths workman here now even as, as uh, of yore. So with the power of the establishment, in particular the London Times, which it's difficult to explain how powerful that was. It was of the equivalent of um, Sky, BBC, CNN, all rolled into one because it was the voice of the establishment here and of everybody. And these people had the ear of the London Times and it promulgated doctrines about providence and the lazy Irish and they looked forward to the day when uh, an Irishman in the bank, the Celt, on the banks of the Shannon would be as rare as an Indian on the banks of the uh, Hudson. So people didn't see, even though they saw, but what they saw coming over here, in a sense, reinforced prejudice because you're these starving, uh, lice-ridden, uh, diseased. -ridden. Can you imagine today, no matter how pathetic their case might be and hungry they might be, but if victims of Ebola showed up in Liverpool or up in Basco on the Clyde getting off a sailing boat, and supposedly they died, as they did very often, as soon as they came ashore. There wouldn't be so much sympathy people would feel as how do you get, the way, get away from this body or this disease. So all that was very much manipulated. And this huge uh, drain of humanity, this very savage toll on uh, the psyche of the people. Um, they have a, a statistic for measuring these things, or a method, which it's not ordinary mortality. You take in the increased mortality. You go back, how many people, what was the average death in, in an area? We'd say it was 20% of the ordinary mortality. When I take Mayo, um, if there's a crisis, you can't say that this was directly caused by, say, famine fever or by starvation. No more than you could say that the recent uh, heat wave in France, which killed a lot of people, you wouldn't say somebody died because of too much sunburn or that he died uh, of you know, some sun-related disease. But quite clearly, uh, the suffocation or the heart attack or whatever it was, was brought on by this condition of abnormal heat. And in the same way, they reckon that in Mayo, for example, the, the mortality went up to 31%. So with, with, um, in, that, in that period, so with emigration as well, I mean, the idea that Mayo would ever come back and have a, a football team in the All Ireland, you know, it's remarkable if you think about it, that had that much energy left. The Irish was one of the most resilient races in the world. But emigration was set in train, and the population decline went on to where it is now. I mean, it's supposed to be doing marvelous that we're nearing 4.9 million or something, and a million plus in the north. But that was one of the uh, lasting impacts of the famine. And of course, there was the lasting impact of uh, the effect on the Irish economy. Uh, with all that, the people were so uh, downtrodden that there wasn't a rebellion. The nearest thing they got to was in 1848 with the Young Islanders, which ended up in a cabbage patch with a few shots being fired. And sort of people, Lando and so on, who had never taken up weapons, so disgusted, they tried to do something, got nowhere and were transported and so on. And they, these were the kind of people who became governor generals of provinces in Australia and so on. But there was really no, I mean, the Fenian rebellion came to nothing. And it wasn't until 1916 which really had a, a, enough outrage to have a, a blood rebellion, people risking their lives and having enough of them to do something. So it really had a very traumatic effect.
from that point of view. It had other effects, of course. It um, impacted the, um, the church very much on the people because of individual priests and particularly nuns who went into appalling situations of filth and disease and tried to minister to the dying. And at the same time, the authority of the church was enormously boosted. The very powerful and energetic Cardinal Cullen came back from Rome just after the worst part of the family came back in 51. And really from then on you see Ireland under two forms of canonicism, Mother England and Mother Church. And the authority, the deferential, the, the, the feeling that you're really not tightly to use your own imagination, or this is wrong, would come out, which you'll see very strongly up to our day, is traceable to the family. I mean, nobody has gone to jail yet for what was done to the economy of Ireland and for the modern exodus of emigrants, for the unemployment, for the mass suicide. More people have died uh, from suicide during the bust years after the Celtic Tiger than were killed in the 30 years of the Troubles and yet no one has gone to jail. And 10 attorney generals were able to write a letter to the papers saying that the, uh, this was far too serious an issue to interfere with the man's right to his good name and the independence of the judiciary if dog committees were set up to investigate this. So to this day, even though there is somewhere around the corner some sort of a doll inquiry coming, banking inquiry, people still don't know what happened. There are, here and there are very expensive, slow-moving court cases, but there's no outrage in the streets, no demand uh, for blood, and not even blood, just accountability. Uh, the country is now burdened <coughs> with 125 billion of debt for four and a half million people to pay off. But nobody thinks this is outrageous. Just close to me recently, a man who lost his business was now driving a taxi. He drove out to a place, a graveyard near me called Shangana. Graveyard. He tied one end of uh, a rope around a tree and he fed the other into the taxi and fed it around his neck, revved up the taxi and decapitated himself. Now in a very real sense, his blood is on the hands of these bankers, lawyers, accountants who signed off on these accounts, and, and so on. And that is exactly the way it was during the famine. You could pass resolutions blaming Sir John Russell for death, uh, for willful murder at an inquest, but there was no question of any suing, and the landlords were clearing people off. Evictions kept going throughout all that. Some landlords, good landlords, always individual good people, did try and stayed on their land and tried to help the people. But by and large, with no government, um, tragically at the end of his life, this all really burst on Daniel O'Connell, and he, he died prophetically, as it were, in the very worst year, Black 47. And Disraeli, the uh, fellow who had, the conservative who had uh, founded the modern conservative party and had brought about the coup that toppled the uh, appeal, uh, he was asked, what about, what do you think of O'Connell's last speech? And he said, I didn't see anything feet of, you know, oratory. I saw an old man muttering at the dispatch box. And that, in fact, was the response. The leading men of the country, including um, O'Connell, waited on the Chief Secretary when the famine was just beginning to come about, and they said, this is what needs to be done. They want the ports closed to the export of food. They want an end to the distillation of grain for alcohol. And they wanted public works and the whole thing would have been paid for with the Irish forest being set aside as the kind of collateral. They were just ushered out. Now, why hasn't this genocidal process, which it was, it was a deliberate attempt, and the, uh, <coughs> the remarks are there in cabinet meetings, in letters, like one, one lord, kindly man, Monteagle, wrote to Woods, the 
Chancellor of the Exchequer and he was talking about the very best of people are going, the tenants are going, and he got a very snotty note back from the Chancellor saying, I'm not at all perturbed by your tenants leaving. This is what we are all agreed would be the solution to the problem. They must go. So anything they did was very palliative and they had people out on work schemes, men and women and children, working for eight pence or ten pence a day. If they could get work, sometimes the roads were frozen, sometimes the bureaucracy and the paperwork couldn't be fitted in. <coughs> Uh, sometimes there were the wrong names, and by the time the person would get the work, he'd be dead. It was all the time they were starving. And so it went. <coughs> I've given various uh, accounts of individual tragedies. I'll just mention one now. Uh, there was a, Nora Connolly. You mentioned Ms. Connolly here earlier. Um, she uh, left her children in a remote part of Kerry, and starving, of course made her way across a mountain, possibly 20 miles we're talking about. You've got to factor in the roads and so on. And she got there. Her name wasn't on the list. She wasn't, you know, qualified for aid. So somehow or another, she dragged herself back. And when she got home, the children were dead of starvation. And a little while later, we discovered that some clerk had got it wrong, misspelled her name, and she was on the list. That was the kind of thing that happened, but no redress for it. There's not, nothing to, uh, who are you going to appeal to? And this, of course, um, <coughs> left a, an appalling legacy of bitterness between Ireland and England. And one of the, uh, now I'll be coming over here, ever since I was a boy, just so far back I don't want to be reminded of it, but I've never seen hostility amongst the ordinary English people. You get a very different impression, of course, you read in the House of Lords reports, the Daily Telegraph, the Daily Mail, or indeed some Irish people, Blue Tuggy Edwards or people like that, but not, not the uh, ordinary English people. And one of the reasons, uh, they just don't know these things. And yet, when Tony Blair apologised for the famine, one of his first things he did, that put in place the peace process. Now, I was involved in the peace process, I know how influential that was, and I know who how influential the Irish in America were. But people just didn't know that. How did they get there? Why are they here and not there? And so on. And this is a question, of course. Why? And one of the reasons is if there was a trace on the cleric amongst the uh, intellectuals in England and the politicians and the decision takers, how much more was there amongst Irish? Historians, there's this weird notion that if you tell the truth about a situation, in some way, uh, you would inflame relations between the two countries, and or, during the Troubles in particular, you might give aid and comfort to the Provos or to the IRA. So they didn't, uh, for a long time, and before, this was a long time, this was set in train a long time before the North blew up. As far back as uh, 1945, de Valera wanted to have a volume commemorating the famine, a worthy work. So he commissioned um, Robin Dudley Edwards, that's uh, Robert Dudley Edwards, that's Ruth Dudley Edwards' father, uh, to edit with a man called Desmond Williams, who had some British intelligence background, a very brilliant man. Uh, he, during the Nuremberg trials, he worked there as, as a translator, whatever strange job he had. He was very brilliant. They were both professors in, of history in the National University of Ireland. And uh, like a lot of people who came after them, they were ca uh, from Cambridge, Peterhouse in particular, Peterhouse School, who were Whigs. They would be dis direct descendants of the Liberals. They would have the, the, the attitude of John Russell and others. and. Uh, they took the money all right, but the book didn't appear. The volume to commemorate the famine didn't appear. It didn't appear for 13 years. It didn't appear until the 50s. And it consisted of seven essays in the end about aspects of it. And even Dudley Edwards said that one of the things missing was who was responsible. Wouldn't face up to, they hadn't faced up to response. 
He didn't himself write anything. And that kind of set the template for it. The book was very carelessly put together. They didn't seem to have any mass on it, so they treat any dignity. I knew two of the men who pulled it together, and they both contributed to it. One was Tom O'Neill, who used to write editorials for the Irish press for me. I, so did Desmond Williams, I knew him as well. And the other was um, Kevin B. Nolan. And they went around to these fellows' offices and found bits of manuscript and shadows and so on. They eventually stitched the thing together. But when it came to saying who was responsible, that issue was left to one side. And the whole thing was a cobble together. The, the introduction to it was signed by the initials of uh, Dougie Edwards and Williams. But it was revealed later that in fact they didn't write even that much. That was done by Nolan, whom as I say I knew, who told me this. And it's been acknowledged publicly as well. So the family was always a strange thing and a difficult thing to keep off it. Then the trouble started and uh, this Cambridge idea of uh, Peter House, and be careful now, don't rock the boat. If you want to post as a lecturer, check, you know, professor or even a semester somewhere, or to get your students advanced, um, follow the approved line. And so it was, it was some American historians, Irish American historians, went a bit further and far better. Uh, Kirby Miller was one who wrote that very fine book uh, about immigrants and exiles. And he, he, he was human enough to point out that a lot of these immigrants saw themselves as exiles. They didn't want to go, but they were just driven out. And another one, Donnelly was his name, uh, he went down through the various um, complaints and things to say, and he finally, he addressed the issue partially, and he said, um, some of the policies certainly uh, had a genocidal outcome, but they did not have a genocidal intent. And now I say that's just rubbish. They did have a genocidal intent. They wanted to get the overcrowded, congested districts board all to the left, and it was all through Ireland. Leases were in shambles, there was overcrowding, there was uneconomic rent being gathered, and the famine was taken as providential, that was the word they used, and they made no meaningful effort to um, deploy the efforts of the <coughs> empire to um, stopping that flow, that hemorrhage. And it's quite amazing, uh, I've been debating since the book came out, there's a good bit of controversy, and two episodes in particular are worth recalling. Uh, I was talking to one editor with Dublin Castle, we a fairly large scale debate, about, uh, about the, exactly what I'm saying, and I said, as I'm saying now, and this man who had edited another book, uh, Famine Atlas it's called, it's very good as far as it goes, but of course completely shies away from the issue of culpability. Very much like the banking tribute, notes to blame, it's a system, you know, try and get past it, touch your cap and go over the wall sort of thing, colonial cringe. And he said, uh, I couldn't say it was genocidal. Look, didn't they cut the soup? The soup kitchens, they fed the people, couldn't say if they did that, that it was genocidal. And that, in effect, is one of the worst accusations you can make. They kept famine at bay by feeding the soup. But it was too expensive and it was not having the right effect. Certainly it was keeping them alive, but it wasn't clearing them off the land. So they stopped it. They closed the food depots, which they were giving out free corn from, or cheap corn. And they introduced work schemes and made it uh, mandatory that you went into the workhouse if you're going to get aid. And then they changed that around. It's quite weird trying to describe it. I mean, it so stands logic on its head. They made it impossible for women and children, the weak and the infirm, to get into workhouses. You had to be able-bodied. So, I mean, just that <coughs> multiplied the deaths and the acceleration. And the other thing, I remember I was debating with a fellow called Gray, who's, uh, I presume you've gone to the unionist, he's teaching up in, uh, <coughs> in that red brick um, Victorian 
provincial establishment at the banks of the Lagan, known as Queen's University. And um, uh, I, I said, well, for example, uh, one of the things they might have done is use the army to cut roads through places like Eris and so on to distribute. Well, you couldn't do that, they were too weak. You couldn't do that. Look at the Crimea. Well, now, if you just think at the moment, the Crimea, as far back as that, and by the way, of course, the Crimea War occurred after the famine, but never mind that. Professors of history are not meant to know these things. <laughs> and also, instead of starving peasants who would have been so delighted to see them coming, but you think they got a few bob to help them clear the roads, you had dirty big Russians with dirty big guns in places like Sebastopol who were able to stand off the Turks, the French, and the English. And most of you, when you were young, went to school, you'd have heard of the Charge of the Light Brigade. But it was into those guns at Sebastopol uh, at, in the Crimean War that those people were slaughtered as far back as that. But any excuse is good enough. Another one I heard from another professor in uh, uh, UCD who did whatever good work was done from UCD, he did at Kwame Mugwada. But he said, you couldn't, uh, you couldn't have a close of ports to food and so on. I mean, the farmers would have something to say about that. <laughs> And so butter and eggs and meat flowed out, went out under the um, sorry, went out under the guardianship, very often of Irish police and Irish troops, along roads, the ditches of which were filled with dying peasants, the mouths green from eating leaves and that kind of stuff. And one of the great crimes of uh, civilization was allowed to occur under the name of economy, political economy, clearing the land of surplus population, and it left Ireland with all forms of psychological and historical baggage, but it also left the world a different place, whether it was in Australia, where the, uh, the numbers are always debated, and there's always some inclination to, by some people always, to minimize the Irish achievement and they say, oh well, it's not that number. But I know that the, the embassy in, 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 Can in Australia would reckon about 40% of the population there is Irish descent. You know yourself what it is over here. The same in America, in Canada. It was one of the great traumatic events of, uh, of civilization. And it's, uh, there's a message in it for us. We just can't end up with soft words, blame the Brits for a few dead politicians. If people in power, get irresponsible and just produce um, a goal, the golden calf, profits, or in our case in Ireland in recent times, the golden bullet, development, you get recession, they call it. Recession is when other people are out of work or hungry. But we had the famine, we just had a recession, and there are, and we may or may not be coming out of it. I don't have the same rosy view of it as you get from government statements. But however, it's better than it was, and that's to be thankful for. It's left us with problems in the north, with the Protestant Catholic thing still. It's left many scars on us. But whatever has left us or not left us, it's something we shouldn't overlook. And we shouldn't leave partisan, party political writers or politicians to tell us the history. We should look it up ourselves and make your minds up. The people like the taxi driver living down the road from me are like the woman who marched across the mountain and then back to find her children dead. They at least deserve the dignity of being told what really happened. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tim Pat. Thanks a lot. And I'm sure there'll be some questions after. So we're going to have a comfort break now. We're going to get some tea, coffee, and maybe another glass of wine if we're lucky. Uh, and after that, we'll have some questions. But, and I've got a few announcements to make, which I will do them because I know you're going to have uh, uh, questions and a discussion. But we do have a, a fantastic raffle this evening. Um, we have uh, presented to us. Um, uh, uh, offer of a lunch and dinner for two 
indeed at the House of Lords. Kindly <laughs> <laughs> donated by our good friends and colleague Lord McKenzie. So there's one good one. We've got to be found one good one. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a dinner for two at the Ramada Inn Corp Hotel Luton, and that's kindly donated by the Ramada Inn Corp Hotel. We've got an Irish food hamper. Will we keep the food uh, theme going? Uh, kindly donated by Jerry Taylor, butcher and grocer from Luton. Um, we were granted an annual subscription to the Irish World newspaper, kindly donated by the Irish World. And we have <laughs> a signed copy of Colin Tobin's book, Nora Webster, kindly donated by Hatchards of London. Uh, in addition to that, there are copies of Tim Pat's Plan and Plot. Uh, they are, you're actually going to have to purchase them. They are £9, but I'm sure Tim will be good enough to sign them for them and take them up to him when he gets a few minutes after your questions. Okay, so it's tea and wine time. Thank you. <laughs> the second part of our evening um, entertainment and discussion with uh, questions. Uh, I would ask you to uh, keep it to questions, then we'll be able to try and be fair to everybody and let everybody have, a, have, a, you know, have their, their say and ask their question. Uh, TP, as he said his name, is known by, will answer the questions and I'm sure will elaborate on, on the explanations for you. So, uh, who's going to be the first one with a question? Who's the first one? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 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 I mean, I, I went to school with lads who became distinguished accountants afterwards, and they told me that they would be lying awake at night with ordinary accounts, hoping they'd done it right. Whereas in these cases, people signed them fraudulent accounts. You would know that what they were saying. Could, you see, you're not only meant to sign off up to the 31st of December, we say. It's meant to be a true and valid account of their likely trading pattern in the following year as well. I mean, you don't presume that. The law allows you to give a very rosy picture of a guy up to Sunday, and then on Monday, disaster. Oh, shock horror. You're meant to be able to see the way it's going. You have the figures there, you have the receipts. But they didn't do that. In some cases, like the famous bed and breakfast loan, the biggest provider of pensions in Ireland was Irish Life and Pensions. And they learned several lent what they call the bed and breakfast loan. They gave Irish Nationwide, Michael Finkleton's um, building society, uh, Billions of a loan, almost literally overnight for a few nights, so that they were in credit for the end of the year and then took it all back a few days later. And the accountants who signed off on that should be standing in the dock alongside them all, yeah. but they're not. Yeah. They have some trick of the loop situation whereby you get, you're meant to be doing the figures, the trading position, but if you get a letter of comfort beforehand to say, this is what I'm doing, <coughs> doing the figures, accountancy, I'm not supposed to be divinely inspired or worse to that effect to detect fraud. But of course that comes under the heading of fraud, so they get away, you know? That kind of stuff. Now, what has happened to you is actually damnable. And I, I mean, I'm a great believer in optional immigration. It's a small island, it's insular, and a few years going around this great world of ours is very good for everyone. I'm five. But I'm to be forced out, and, and to be forced out, yeah after studying and after saving and working to buy a house is damnable yeah. and to have it happen by our own government now i would say the same uh, scurrilous lack of oversight unfeeling oversight that you could bring to bear on the palmerstons and the russells and the woods and all that but 
the complete feel of all governments and the senior civil servants and the people look the other way in the very same way. And they'd have to pay for your house here, immigrate and to come and live here. Yeah. And pay, pay for pay everything. Well, I and to pay back. It's, it's utterly wrong, you know. But I mean, I, I wonder, uh, one of the things I think about, uh, I'm going to Manchester to talk about the diaspora more than the famine. One of the themes I want to uh, bring up with them is um, this question of the emigrant vote. Mm. Now people just look and say, oh, you won't get that, you know, they won't let you have that. That'd be damned for a lark, in my answer. They have forced you out. You had a vote at home. Yeah. You were fully entitled to vote. Yeah. To no fault of your own, they took that vote from you yeah. and forced you out. And never mind the mechanics and the cute whore business that get no the coming down in the whole of County Mayo. Yeah. The principle, the ethics of the situation, the morality demand that you should still have a say. Yeah. To think that they could take taxes off you and you can't vote. Yeah. Well they told me I can vote but I have to fly home on a Ryanair flight at my own expense. <laughs> oh, <laughs> okay. So I'm still, I'm still on the electoral road. But I think people in your situation, there is no doubt they have a big axe to grind. Just to yeah, but you come in here. That's just what I'm going to say. Organize. <coughs> Organize. <coughs> That's how you do it. One of the reasons that we've set up this whole idea of cultural seminars is that we involve the, the second and third generation Irish people. And it's not just us going to try and get them to get a team that they get involved in. Yeah. What you're raising tonight is absolutely crucial and just as, yeah. as just as serious. And I uh, suppose it points out that the, the whole system, the laissez-faire system of government and how they how they react both here and the other island, yeah. as they call it, from time to time, has the effect of keeping yeah. the poor poor yeah. and the rich get richer. And I think it was never more prevalent than it is now. But anyway, who else has sorry, a question? Before you leave the thing, before I you leave the lady asked a man to answer. Organise. Come to Ford like that and get people organised. Make your displeasure known, the yeah. petition to the embassy, to the department, and so forth. I have, I, I, John Burton's uh, assistant dismissed me on the phone the other day as being the person who rings and who emailed. Yeah. And I told you, see, if you're on the Irish Forum and on Cloud Division, and all the other Irish Forum in here, yeah. in this country, this other offshore island of ours, I'm telling you, you've got an opportunity. You've got an opportunity with uh, Jimmy, uh, Jimmy Gillahan. Yeah. What? You, uh, a decent man, Jimmy. Bring race. that up with him. Sorry, Alan. Listen to me. Jimmy Gillahan will be over here shortly. You should tell him that. I can't come next Thursday. Did you ever hear anything called the internet? Jimmy the Balochi. Email. That's what you should all do. Use that. And you should keep it up. You're entitled. It's not Jimmy's fault. But it's government. It's responsibility. It's representation. Yeah. Don't yeah. just sit here and get annoyed. Do something about it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Tim, can I thank you for a, a riveting presentation earlier? As you know, I feel doubly exposed uh, <laughs> tonight. I mean, well, being a member of the... Uh, I would just say in defense of the House of Lords currently, since we got rid of the hereditaries, it's not quite as bad as it was in the 1850s. But I wanted to ask a question about the famine itself. At the end of the day, what was it that brought the blight to an end? These were farming techniques that could have been used at any stage in the previous years, or what, what was the development which ultimately brought it to an end? Well, so just, just touching on the House of Lords, it, it uh, certainly is not as bad, it's not as powerful as it was. But it's a bit like the Irish Shannon, you begin to wonder what it's for. As to the blight, that's a very good point. This spore, this, um, what is it, infestus, something or other, the, the Latin name is in the book, um, it came, uh, apparently, well, there's different um, <coughs> theories. Uh, I believe Togusk, that's the Agricultural Institute in Ireland doing research. It seems to, some people say it came across the sea, but it seems to be, have come uh, in guano, in, in bird droppings. Uh, which they were using as uh, fertilizer on um, farms. 
I was talking to Michael D. Higgins once, and he said that he had done research. I suppose, uh, being a laborer or any politician, I suppose it would behoove you uh, to do research into SH1T. But <laughs> what he was doing was uh, <laughs> investigating the amount of stuff um, <coughs> which was sold in uh, shops like, you know, the, the Gombe Band shop uh, all around the country. And there were huge sales of it uh, in, the, in rural areas. And they reckoned that that's where it started. Now, as it progressed, uh, it, it, was, it was like it was the Ebola of plant diseases. You no know, remedy, no nothing. But during the famine, a man, I think his name is Fitzgerald, I've written about it there anyway, uh, he was a landowner in, I think he'd been mayor of Limerick, a well doing man. And to no fault of his own, he got wiped out by the famine. His uh, land ended up being nabbed in our terms, you know, taken by the state covered the state's mechanism and sold off for pittance. But he actually discovered uh, the use of um, the blue stone, that you now see spreading everywhere. And he sent this up to the castle, but being a poor illiterate, well, yeah, brilliant now, but uh, that shyness that Irish people have because they don't have degrees and the gentry, you know, with an lordly accent, using their accents as a method of control. He didn't um, pursue it, they didn't answer him. Somebody threw it to one side and said, ah, that's rubbish. But actually, he had discovered it, and he would have reverted four or five years of famines had they taken it up. And it was, it was later used, uh, not only for the Jaitras, but for, in, in vino culture uh, as well, for whatever it is, rust on, on grape leaves. Part of the spray that they use. Pardon? Part of the spray that they use to... Today, the blue stone, they spray yes. blue stone on, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. 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 In fact, if you're watching, getting on airplanes sometimes, watching middle-aged ladies come from America, you'd say it affects the hairdressing. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, sir. yes. I right now. Am I to understand there was a general election, bang smack in the middle of the famine? And uh, no, it's just one thing I noticed. I was in Dublin there recently. Alice Bar opened in 1848, which uh, seems a strange time to open a bar, and yet there was a general election, and the famine was on top of the agenda. Well, of course. Am I right? Yeah, it, it, um, so the, the Young Ireland's Revolution faded out. You could have come to Dublin and had uh, the impression it was a great place for crack balls and dances and parties all through it. But you could have gone to, I mean, that happens anytime, anywhere. You could have gone to the north of Ireland during the trouble. Unless you had a little roadblock or something, you wouldn't think of anything you could invest upon, invest in France. That's, that's the way the misery of the people are out on the periphery, and we, the, you know, the elite, are in the charm circle. Is that with, what the, with the general election, surely that must have been, you know, when you'd be knocking on the door, on some case there's no door looking for a boat. You might say, well, I'm going to do something about the famine. If you open your mouth, it's a very easy lose and now you holding your hand. <laughs> because the landowners, John Mitchell has written about this, you know, the scene at an election in Galway. And uh, that is, you know, they, you had a panel, you vote for them, and if you were seen to stand up against the vote elsewhere, you're not just talking about yourself, you're talking about your wife and kids out on the side of the road. I don't suppose they knew an awful lot about the famine in Dublin and in England. They didn't, they did know a bit about it, but again, more like, the, ah yes, there is a kind of a camp that it didn't affect Dublin at all, but that's not so, it did. Um, like, if you look to the major graveyards, they, uh, they were meticulous, for example, now in Glasnevin, they always are, about taking bodies in. You just can't murder someone and have them buried in Glasnevin, forget them. Mm -hmm. You've got to have family there, papers, documentation, and they're very careful. But for, for disease prevention reasons, they had to go out every morning and take the piled up bodies from outside the railings and bury them. And the other graveyards, the same. And the numbers of internments or internments you're talking about at least 50% of a rise, if not more, in each graveyard. So we want to buy over severe. And then you had the other kind of deaths, like in the overcrowded slums. 
So it aren't affected everyone. But um, it, I, I was just looking at, I was talking about the history earlier, but you know, going back to the history thing, it's very serious because this is what people were trained. <coughs> Irish people, a man called Cullen wrote a history, economic history, a professor of economics in Trinity. And in his book, if you read it, he pours water on anybody who would say that the woolen trade, the cattle trade, was destroyed by the British by saying that, um, mm. well, you know, we're selling the stuff to the French, you couldn't have that, there was war with them. That's perfectly right, they stopped it, you know. And uh, I mean, it's not enough to state the reason, but he has to defend it. And he went on from there to say, the famine didn't really affect Dublin. That was accepted because people like him wrote that. But it's not true. Again, the ordinary people, and Michael Collins used to say, it's not the manager you need to know in a hotel, it's the boots. He sees all that's going on. He'll tell you, he'll get you in a day to night. And he'll get you a drink or the key in the door to tell you want to shoot or whatever. You know. <laughs> 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 in your book, you make it sound, you've made it as awful all countries and the excessive debts due to calendar talks. Now, I know Limerick was quite low, it was just 21% or something in, in compared to the rest of Ireland. And but it was um, prosperity around Limerick to a degree. It's a golden to day in that Yeah, well, you would expect that, that there was some food in that part of the country. But the, the counties that seem to suffer worse were the western counties like Galway and Mayo. They always the worst, yeah. And all down that coast. Oh, it's not believable, yeah. It's hard to believe. And again, it's kind of escalated, you know, because. I mean, just think of census enumerators. Got out in bad weather, maybe. There's no road out there, you know. But what they do know is there's a couple of hundred little Bohans, muddy places, with SH1T piled up outside them. Mud. mud. That's the way it was, the census. I mean, the dirty Irish came from that time, you know that phrase. And <coughs> he's got to go in and, and count everybody in that. What's he going to do? Got to do a calculation to back on them. Go yes, the yes. I mean, when you have people who are still telling you that their granny was telling them when they were kids that her grandmother had 18 children, it gives you an indication, you know. And there are even more than that in some cases. You have the Catholic birth rate, you have uh, no television. Whatever <laughs> 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 you're having yourself, sir. I've got Jerry first, and then Seamus. Yeah, Jerry. There was a former Lord Mayor of Cork who complained that uh, those on the dome they weren't immigrating in, some, uh, immigrating in sufficient numbers and they were a drain on the economy. He was later drowned apparently by accident in, in the sea. And my complaint was that he was. It was an accident. He could have been thrown to investigate it. And the same should happen to all these people that are uh, involved in this. Well, I can't possibly agree with that. But, uh, there, are, there are in human affairs situations which accelerated swimming lessons are. <laughs> <laughs> right, show us. Uh, Tim Pat, I'm just wanting to come up to modern times a bit. Thanks again for the fantastic uh, description of the famine and bringing us all up to speed on what actually happened there. But I was lucky enough the other night, or unlucky it may be, to have sat in front of Andy Kenny, uh, listening to him explaining to us uh, how fantastic things are in Ireland. And it reminded me a little bit about the speeches that Bertie Ahern was making during the time of the Celtic Tiger. And are we heading down that same route? Is that arrogance beginning to develop again? Well, <laughs> 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 and it's arrogant to refer to him. He's a Mayo man, though, and he knows him. <laughs> Mayo. But the fact is, is, you're right. I mean, there's no bullshit about it. There is a bubble in the housing market in Dublin. Yeah. Yeah. It's back, it's heading up to, to uh, the levels, you know, it, it's, it's not there yet, that was usher for that, but it is there. But it's like the pale, outside the city. Go down to Kerry, is there a job? No. You know, in Dublin you would find people queuing and buying houses, cash buyers, you know, enormously inflation prices. I know 
three bedroom semi D, an old lady a friend of mine died, she was 103. So you can imagine a good deal number of years had passed over the poor woman's head before a coat of paint had been put on the wall. <laughs> Central heating, forget it. She had a scullery kitchen that she negotiated to her You know, Beatrice Brook. You know, <laughs> she stepped over to get into the gas cooker, etc., etc. And um, they were reckoning that the the estate agent told them that um, you know you should get about the three, but don't look for three. Look for three fifty, so it'll come down. Otherwise, they'll be down to two fifty. In the event, about five hundred people turned up. And they sold it for five seventy. <laughs> but that just is not healthy. Mm -hmm. I don't know what he would say. There's a vast amount of building going on in the line of uh, extensions and renovations. But two uh, bungalows. I live in the slums of Dorothy, and just a, across the road from there, uh, uh, two bungalows. When they're very fine looking bungalows, too, you know, good. And they had worked on them, you know. Then we dumped them on to January, which anyone can tell you is a no-no. They were gone in a fortnight. And now they're boarded up all around them with workmen night, noon, and morning. God knows what they're doing in there. West Fork, you know. Huge. And that's happening all over the place. Now, Seamus is right. That's, that's, um, that's very good from the point of view of what you were saying about the rich class, the, <coughs> the, the trace on the clerk people, the accountants, the lawyers. The most afflicted, in a sense, by the, the bust with the lawyers because making as much <coughs> immoral money and income as they were, they got huge borrowings from the financial institutions. And there are many in a, uh, a judge who was taken early retirement not to be bankrupted on the bench. <coughs> and they staggered along there and as the thing rose and they helped to block progressive legislation, like Dog Commission, like the ten attorney generals who signed I mean you wouldn't have believed um, Brendan Bean had um, a saying that uh, so-and-so had a neck like a jockey's appurtenances. That's <laughs> not quite how he put it. But two of the people of the ten who signed that letter to the paper saying they shouldn't be investigating, uh, the all committee shouldn't be investigating what happened because it would uh, interfere with the man's right to his good name and the independence of the judiciary. Two of them, one was the former chairman of Allied Irish Bank, and the other was Peter Sutherland of Goldman Sachs. Anyway, that passed on. Sorry, just, I just want to say my house is in Donegal, which is why I'm so for Dublin is okay. <coughs> and that's where the price are coming back up. But my house is in serious negative equity. I want a debt write off at this point because I cannot move on. Yeah, well, the life. lawyers are, are conspiring with the government, with the banks. Because the Dublin thing is bring, bringing up their holdings. Yeah, but there's no rurals. Oh, I know, yeah, no I know. Spread, well, like, don't you know, just protest here, take it further. I have, yeah. and I've been ignored. Yeah. I know, and you won't be get the group with you. <coughs> yeah, uh, hi, Tim, Pat, yeah. Um, I have about six or seven questions, really, but uh, <laughs> a, couple of, a, couple of, a couple of years ago. Yeah, no big <laughs> years ago I attended a meeting in Cork, it was uh, about um, you know, the comparison between uh, anarchism and uh, radical um, communism, and I, uh, I was uh, in a group of perhaps about 50 people who basically they could not agree between each other as to, there, there, wasn't, there, there, were, there weren't two people in the room that could actually agree as to what their political label was. So I, I, I contributed that perhaps um, that groups of people should get together and occupy these um, half-built estates in Ireland and t take some, uh, take a stand, basically, a kind of a, 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 an organised stand. Um, the difficulty was that I was actually Facebook was that I was I was sitting in a, amongst a group of radicals and they couldn't agree amongst themselves even on, a, on the most basic thing. And on the other hand, we have a, a, a group of people who, who who are money laundering and who are uh, cooking the books, etc. At what level of political activity do you think would be successful in Ireland to actually move the thing on where people could have a, actually have a collective ownership of a political movement that would change the, the financial situation in Ireland? Good boy. Uh, of course, that's a great question. People feel excluded and powerless like that lady was. But the only 
simple answer I can give to that complicated question is join a political party, don't leave it to them. My mother would be saying, don't leave it to them. Get involved, get active. The ballot box, the vote is one head of it. Look at those people that came out, those noble people in Hong Kong. And it's incredible, even the Chinese leadership have learned from Tiananmen Square. There were no shooting at that meeting. They listened to the voice. And what are they protesting about? Looking for what we already have, the vote. And for the extension of it, I would say, to the, to the uh, emigrants. Could I just add a comment, if, that, if that's okay? Is there any way of stopping one, one, one of the most, <laughs> thank you. Uh, one of the most unfortunate um, inheritances of the famine is uh, a division uh, amongst the, the population of, uh, unfortunately, people were forced to, to look after themselves first. And we seem to have inherited that on a, quite a, a large social scale. On, on face value, yes, we're all wonderful, Ireland of, of the friendly and all this kind of stuff. But on a, on a, actually, to live there, there's a massive division. People are enormously selfish. Um, you know, I was told by a trade unionist, for example, one time that he wouldn't have his son to go to the same school as me because, well, hey. So, um, it's like... How can how I think you can should really elaborate on that? <laughs> <laughs> okay, it, okay. So the trade union representative. Yeah, why I was working on the same job as him, and he was sending his his, his son to pre prez in, in in Cork, and he said, well, you know, I, I how I, I wouldn't send uh, my son to the same school as you, uh, so therefore why not? Why? Because uh, um, I was uh, actually seen as some some form of lower being to him because somehow or other. He, he, he grasped the power that was, ever, that was available to him as a trade union representative, and he was completely the wrong person to be a trade unionist. Because, uh, okay, but okay. the point is, uh, I suppose, really, uh, it's unfortunate that we have inherited from the sure. famine, I think. I, 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 was, I know these statements with, with question marks somewhere absent at the end. On the other hand, you made a very sincere point there, an important one, which I should have touched on in my talk, and I meant to say it. There's no soft words in the Irish family. You don't just blame the Brits and the Liberals and the landlords and maybe the clergy or the lack of clergy or whatever. And I'll come back to that. There's a reason why I'm not so sympathetic to the church as you might expect me to be. You have to remember the quality of the Irish. Who ended up with the land in the end? Who did the landlords offload it onto? Catholics. Yeah. Neighbours of these people. Yeah. People whose kids went to school with theirs and they smiled at each other as they put the hand in the holy water front coming down and kept their mass. They were the same people that went to the landlord and offered them when the place was in Nama or a bit, you know, encumbered or behind. They offered them a few quid extra and got the land and got the other people turfed out. We have that. I mean, the Irish have, I, I think it's a good description that somebody said to me once, the Irish are like a peach. Very soft and sweet and succulent, but by God, there's one head of a big stone there. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think you overlooked that at your feet of that, at your peril, when you got a good dentist. Yeah. <laughs> very conscious of the time, there's a lady at the back, and then... Yeah. <coughs> Is that me? Yeah. yeah, that's you. <laughs> Hi, I just wanted to come back to, you said that the, the famine the roots of the famine can be felt in the diaspora around, around the world. One thing that's always I found very interesting is why in England Irish history has never been taught in schools, in particular Catholic schools. And I've been very interested because I used to teach and I saw, I've seen people argue and I've completely agreed with their argument from the black community about um, children of Afro-Caribbean heritage having a right to their own history. I've never heard it. I've never heard it. I could be wrong. I even swam, for some reason I was looking on the website of the local Catholic school here and it's Black History Month. Yeah, it's never Irish History Month. Mm -hmm. And I just wondered if you had any thoughts 